Hello, everybody. I've been teeing up this guest for a little bit, building up the anticipation, and I'm really excited to uh, take you all to class. Class is in session, ladies and gentlemen. We both got a lot to work on, so unless you're in a car presently for the podcast, make sure you got your notebook and pen and paper uh, ready. You know, If not, listen to it in the car and then go back and take some notes because this is going to be a fun one. So I have Peter Fader with me today. Let me give you some background on him, and then let's get into his book. Uh, which is the subject of our conversation. This uh, this gentleman is the Francis and Pei Huan Cha Professor of Marketing at the Wharton School at the University of Pennsylvania. His expertise centered around the analysis of behavioral data to understand and forecast customer shopping activities. He works with firms from a wide range of industries, telecom, financial services, entertainment, retailing, Managerial applications uh, focus on topics such as customer relationship management, lifetime value of the customer, and sales forecasting for new products. Much of his research highlights the consistent but often surprising behavioral patterns that exist across these industries and other seemingly different domains. In addition to his various roles and responsibilities at Wharton, Professor Fader co-founded a predictive analytics firm back in 2015, which was then sold to Nike back in 2018. He then co-founded and continues to run Theta, Equity Partners to commercialize his more recent work on customer-based corporate valuation. I've listened to some of this conversation, some really cool uh, developments in that uh, practice and industry. He's the author of Customer Centricity, Focus on the Right Customers for Strategic Advantage, and co-author with Sarah Toms on the book, Customer Centricity Playbook. He has been quoted or featured in the New York Times, Wall Street Journal, Economist, Washington Post, and on NPR, among uh, among other media. And back in 2017, Professor Fader was named by Advertising Ages as one of its inaugural 25 marketing technology trailblazers and was the only academic on the list. Quite a lengthy intro, Pete, but we're actually here to talk about this book, which I believe is your newest release, is it not? That is right, the customer-based audit. It's, a, it's the newest release, but it's one that's been in planning stages far longer than the other ones. This is a, a dream that goes back 20 years. Uh, and it's, it's been just an interesting journey and it's it's great to see it realized. Really fun, yeah. And I think that even it was referenced in some of you, you do a lot of the really cool examples and a lot of them are anonymized so we can actually look at real company data without, you know, uh, showing behind the curtains per se. And it looks like, yeah, some of the examples you're talking about going through this exercise are decades ago. So this is not a new practice by any means, not even for you. That's right. It, 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 these are uh, ideas that have been swirling around, battles that I've been fighting, practices that I've been promoting really since the turn of the century. Uh, and in, in some sense, it's, it's good that we waited because I think uh, – industry your listeners i think are mm -hmm. just in a better position now to take advantage of, of a lot of these these learnings than than would have been the case 20 years ago we're just more sophisticated there's a more of a competitive imperative to do it uh data is better uh so it's you know uh, good good things happen for, for those who wait Absolutely. I, I'm I'm excited. I'm uh throwing myself in the thick of this arena and we, we might get into that a little bit. Um I know you're an analytics guy, obviously, uh, and and I happened to do a little snooping and heard on another podcast that you, you like another uh, field that's really into analytics, which is Major League Baseball. Uh, my understanding is you're a Phillies guy, so I'm big into sports, especially baseball and my Atlanta Braves. So I, I got to ask you, from your analyst hat, not necessarily your fan hat, um, what are you looking at um, when it comes to the finish of the MLB season and the postseason, perhaps? Oh, it's been it's been just a, a really interesting season. Let, let's face it, MLB itself has taken a lot of big bold steps this year, and it seems like they've been paying off. You know, we we, we always like to kind of criticize the leadership of, of any sports league, but sometimes you got to give credit where it's due. So it's been it's been exciting to watch. It's been just I'd like to say it's been a horse race, but uh, but that's only if you count the. Uh, 1973 Kentucky Derby is a horse race when when Secretariat was 31 lengths ahead. I mean, that, that that's where your yeah. brains are. And they yeah. are a thoroughbred, and they are built to run. Uh, and it's just a question of uh, whether the, the long, long regular season will be indicative of uh, the, the playoffs or whether mm -hmm. the Phillies can find a little bit of October magic like they did yeah. last year. Uh, yeah. So, you know, uh, hope springs eternal. 
That's that's what's frustrating to me about baseball, of course, from where I'm sitting. Like, you know, I want things to be much tougher for the wild cards, but it is kind of that thing, you know, where baseball is a marathon followed by, you know, a sprint or a 200 meter dash. And it really is. If you get into the dance and you're hot and you're healthy at the right time, like the Phillies were, if you get the roster where you can get hot, um, you know, that that is what it is. So, I mean, as much as I love the Braves dominating, um, you know, it all starts from scratch in, in October. I know the, you know, the Phillies and the Dodgers and some other teams are going to have something to say about that. But I do agree that the the rule changes have been a lot of uh, fun. I Number one, I think, is the quicker games has been a godsend for the game. I think a lot of more casual fans are going to tune in now. Um, there's more base running. I, as a purist, did not like um, – ending the shift i want to put more responsibility and hitters to do their job but you know it's all been a very fun brand of baseball to watch so it's fun to hear that you're you're a baseball guy and i i, I wouldn't be surprised if you're into the sabermetrics and some of the analytics that go along with it too you know i i am i actually was i don't want to say inventing that stuff but i was uh, i'm old uh, and before anyone knew who bill james was yeah uh, I, I i hate to admit this i grew up as a yankee fan back in the, the early mm. 70s yeah um, you. And, and I was, just, I would collect every bit of information and look for patterns and try to find, you know, appropriate summary statistics. I mean, nothing compared to uh, what goes on today. Right. Um, so I was always into it. And, and in many ways, I'm kind of glad that I was born before all that stuff, because otherwise mm -hmm. I, I would have gone down such a rabbit hole. Yeah. Uh, and it's nice that I can enjoy this stuff. I've had the, the privilege of doing a major project with Major League Baseball and work with many of the clubs, including the Braves. Uh, mm. So so it's been fun to have access and to be able to, you know, go to World Series games and do stuff like that, but at the same time not being consumed by it. So I can right. enjoy it as a hobby, uh, you know, but, but I can turn it off. And it turns out that a lot of t taking the same – uh, you know, passion for metrics and prediction and all this sort of thing and applying it to customers instead uh, right. ends up being much more unique, more fruitful, uh, and just just had a, just a better opportunity to kind of move a needle um, right. rather than being just one of a, of a million kind of smart, engaged people doing it in the sports world. Right. And, and to that point, I, I mean – um, the spreadsheets are really important. Um, and, and these days that's the way it is with business too. Like I enjoy watching the game and playing the game of business, but I mean, I think that that's what a lot of your book uh, gets into, but you know, customer centricity, it was a, a big release and a, and a, a big book of yours with a lot of best practices for strategy. But you say, uh, in the book that I own and, and read the customer base audit, that a customer base audit is the first step to that, uh, that state, so to speak. Let me challenge you on this, or at least ask for the the naysayers out there. Can a business be customer centric without a customer base audit? Why or why not? Uh, yes, in fact, each one can be done independently of the other. So, so actually, let me first flip the question the other way. Um, okay, I think it's 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 great for every company to do a customer base audit whether they're customer centric or not. I mean, even if, if it's just about developing and selling product, 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 the health of the business is the health of the customer base. So mm -hmm. even if you're not kind of playing my kind of game and focusing mm -hmm. on the best customers and figuring out what makes them different, I'm um, just looking at your business through the lens of customer acquisition, retention, mm -hmm. development, spend, is just a more effective way to just gauge how the business is doing. So you don't need to be doing the customer-centric thing to do an audit, and, and therefore vice versa, that, that, mm -hmm. that you, you can actually um, be somewhat customer-centric without being um, as rigorous about the audit as we'd like companies to be. But mm -hmm. you notice the, the way I said it, you can be somewhat, but you can't right. uh, achieve, you can't achieve kind of, you know, peak customer centricity unless you really are down there in the data, understanding the differences, quantifying them, being held accountable, and communicating them to internal and external stakeholders. Right, and so you're like you're right. It is they they are technically ind independent, but very 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 related. And like I said, then it becomes an effectiveness and efficiency conversation, which I'm sure everybody listening to this, we as business leaders. We want to be maximally effective and efficient to our goals. The customer base audit, if you have those means to that end in mind, you do need to do a customer base audit. Now, I will say um, one thing that one might assume had they not read your book is that this is all related to knowing your customer. I think you in the book, you 
you don't quite say that you want to differentiate uh, the audit and those practices slightly from knowing your customer as we discuss. Yes. Yeah. yeah uh, look, knowing your customer, if we take those words literally, it's, it's, mm -hmm. it's, it's a great thing. But the way that they tend to be used in practice is in some kind of lightweight way that's often not accountable. Like, um, uh, first of all, talking about our customer in a singular sense is a big mistake mm -hmm. because there is no mm -hmm. customer. And, and so even for companies that take one baby step away from that, it's like, okay, okay, okay. We have three different kinds of customers and we're going to use personas and we're going to say mm -hmm. we have working Wanda, busy Betty and carpool Carla. And so we kind of grossly oversimplify the customer base. We'll often come up with these 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 personas just out of our mm -hmm. imagination as opposed to out of the data. Okay. Uh, and, and so you know, knowing the customer at that, that kind of shallow level um, can, can often do more harm than good, can give you this, this false sense of, of insight and confidence. Uh, mm -hmm. and, and we just we just want to kind of get in there deep. Uh, mm -hmm. and, and really, this is going to sound almost heretical. I don't want to think about customers as human beings. <laughs> I want to think about them as numbers. Uh, uh, you know, and th there's a lot of, uh, you know, one of the, the hot topics these days, you know, we talk about B2B, B2C. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of people talking about B2H, business to human. Uh, and I'm saying, n n no. <laughs> right. Um, uh, let, let's, let's think about our, our customers. Let, let's not worry so much about, yeah all the the the, the human -y things obviously i don't want to be you know dehumanizing right. either right but but i'm going to trust the data more than i'm going to trust my my instincts about right. what it is that that people want and so on so i i like that point you know a lot of effectively how we'll talk about being customer centric and knowing our customer comes a lot with sweeping gestures and and personality driven personas and um, that kind of thing. We need to get into the data. And, and it, you actually, one thing I think is, I think ultimately encouraging for my target audience, which is more small and mid-sized businesses, typically under 10 million in, in annual revenue or under a hundred uh, in terms of seat count. You talk about the power of customer-centered descriptive analysis, which is counterintuitive to what most of us are doing because you know, most of us think is the big fancy companies wanting to do predictive analytics and AI. And then most all of us, big or small, are more product centric in our analysis. You're talking about, hey, where it's at is customer centered descriptive analysis. What does that mean um, in general, or what 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 potential power is there for smaller and, and mid sized companies if they were to approach that, despite not having what they think are the fancy tools to do the cool stuff? You know, it's kind of ironic that. Some of the best, best practices of, of customer centricity, maybe not the audit so much, but customer centricity per se, um, happens with small businesses. So, you know, you, you open up a coffee shop mm -hmm. and you know everybody walking in the door, at least you know the mm -hmm. regulars. And, mm -hmm. and you, you kind of know, you know, from, from, from the look on, on Harold's face that he had a tough day and you know what he's going to order and you slip him that free biscuit mm -hmm. just because, you know, he, you know, he's coming back tomorrow and he's worth it. So a lot of these practices come naturally to small businesses. Uh, yeah. But then the problem is mm -hmm. you open up the second store. Exactly. You move into a new <laughs> geographic area. And all of right. a sudden, a lot of that intimacy, a lot of that understanding just goes out the window. And then it's all about scaling. It's all about, yeah. as you said, efficiency. And you yeah. actually lose some of the effectiveness in the process. So part of what I'm trying to do, both with customer centricity and the audit, is to show that we can actually retain a, a lot mm -hmm. of that intimacy. We can basically just replace that innate sense of, you know, of, of, of Harold um, mm -hmm. uh, with data analytics and technology. That we can, we can continue to understand the differences across our customers and mm -hmm. leverage them and use them to drive mm -hmm. our, our, our tactics and our strategies. So, I, so that, that's what I'm trying to do is basically mm -hmm. show big companies that they can actually emulate the, mm -hmm. the, those small intimate ones and, and do so uh, at scale um, by, by focusing on customers and differences among customers at least as much as we focus on the products. And, that, and that's beautiful because I think that's the way that you can actually scale strong, high value relationships. Because like you said, if, if Philip owns the coffee shop around the corner 
and I've got 50 regulars at the one place that I'm living and sleeping in my own coffee shop, I can truly identify with my own eyes who are the high value relationships and who do I really pour into because there's 50 of them. Well, what happens when you have five locations with 50 high value regulars? Okay, now we've gone be in. So like you said, it, it, we quickly turn into well, now it's just scale and, and maximizing this and that. You can do that, but you can no longer do it with your eye, your physical eyes. You have to put your eyes on data and that's what the customer base audit does so beautifully. So I wanted to get into some of the other lessons uh, from the book and, and touch on some strong, more specific points. First, let's listen to a, a message from today's episode sponsor, Soul Insights. This episode is sponsored by Soul Insights. Is your business looking to hit the next level of growth? For many businesses, they know they need to spend more on marketing, but don't want to simply shoot in the dark. They want a smart, data-driven path to solid growth. If this is you, then Soul Insights can help you to identify, attract, and retain ideal customers. Soul Insights is a strategic marketing agency which helps small and mid-sized businesses understand their best customers, who they are, their shopping behavior, and acquire new best customers based on that data. Oh, and it's all measured and tracked to ensure you get more profit bang for your marketing buck. Head to soulinsights.com right now and take the 90-second quiz to find your path to the next level. One of my favorite quotes, uh, and I do have to admit, listen, I I am a strategic marketer. I help businesses all the day, and I'm constantly trying to learn you know, best practices and what's going to help my my clients win is I have been that guy in the past that came up with the the avatars and the personas and your average customer is this and you know and I've worked with that your book says there is no average customer I need you Pete to explain this and why distributions are more helpful to businesses than averages it, it's it this goes back to the origins of marketing as we know it you know back in the late 50s early 60s the mad men era but mm -hmm. we had no ability to, to see the differences among our customers. It was just a matter of coming up with the product, the mm -hmm. message to aim mm -hmm. at the customer. And it was pretty quick. We, we started to discover that not all customers were the same. We started to discover right. that we'd have these segments of customers uh, and, mm -hmm. and so on. Um, and and that, be, that created just a real dilemma for companies because now all of a sudden we're going to have to have different messages for the different segments. God yeah. forbid, we might even have to change the product to mm -hmm. be able to, you know, package it or, or communicate it or sell it differently, to different kinds of customers. And again, that would that would uh, hurt the efficiency. Uh, mm -hmm. And all we're doing is taking that to a natural extreme. So, mm -hmm. you know, for a lot of companies, that's where they stop. They said, okay, fine, we have our three segment, the high, medium, low, that's enough. Right. But today, again, given the kinds of data that we have, given the kinds of, of, of technology or the, the analytics capabilities and the competitive imperative, knowing that as soon as yeah. we come up with a good idea, our competitor is going to have it tomorrow, that yeah. we, we just we are obligated just to kind of, you know, get in deeper, get in a more granular way and start to do so at an earlier stage. Because like we said, a lot of small mm -hmm. businesses will just focus on product, product, product. And at mm -hmm. some point when growth plateaus, they said, you know what? Now we should start doing the customer centric thing. Too bad mm -hmm. we didn't do all that tagging and tracking back when we were young and small. So yeah. it's, it's a matter of starting to set the right practices early on, even if you're going to be product centric. But knowing that down the road, three, four years from now, you might want to make that pivot. You might want to mm -hmm. start thinking about some of this stuff. Uh, you need to start doing the audit type thing sooner rather than later so mm -hmm. that, you know, when that time comes, it's not just a matter of flipping a switch, but mm -hmm. you have the infrastructure, the data capabilities, and just the understanding to start to treat different customers differently. Now, to get Absolutely. to the heart of your point, instead mm -hmm. of just saying there's two kinds of customers or three kinds of customers, turns out that there's a vast variety of customers. Turns out that the differences, the heterogeneity, as I like to call it, is, mm -hmm. is tremendous. Your customers are wildly different from each other. We're talking orders of magnitude different from mm -hmm. the best to the worst. And so these differences across customers used to be a nuisance for companies to deal with. Yeah. I like to look at it as an opportunity that if we can see that spread, if we can understand what makes those you know orders of magnitude more valuable customers different and, and leverage them and find more like them, 
that we can make more money in a sustainable, defendable, ethical way than simply mm -hmm. kind of playing it right down the middle at that so-called average customer. Well, I'll lament on the behalf of small and mid-sized businesses. As I've been hearing in the, in the marketing, you know, influential circles for years, personalization, personalization, personalization. I know that there's probably, you know, less helpful versions of that. It may just be marketing puffery, but the big companies, because, you know, we as small businesses will look at them with their big data sets and their ability to, you know, do this cool stuff is they can really do a lot of personalized um, service and even, you know, customized product lines like, you know, Nike famously has where you can like literally build your own shoe and have it delivered to your door within a week and it's literally designed and made for you. Um, I don't know. I don't know that I'm necessarily asking a question. I guess lamenting on top of your point is that it has been a attention point for the smarter, smaller businesses who understand where everything's going is this level of personalization that is, dare I say, expected now amongst consumers and business customers. Uh, it could be daunting. And I guess that's why we just we can't get better. We have to get better and just have better ways to understand our customers and their orders of magnitudes of difference. And, well, and, and let me just restate what you just said. Uh, if personalization is the ultimate goal, that's running, that's sprinting. You got to walk before you can run. You first have yeah. to understand the difference across the customers. That's just, it's fundamental to personalization. Mm -hmm. It's fundamental to good business. So let's not even worry about doing the, the, the customize this, the, the personalize mm -hmm. that just yet. There'll mm -hmm. be time for that. But let's just start by looking at our transaction logs. Kind of boring. And mm -hmm. just understanding the differences in how often people buy from us and you know how many items are in their cart and how much they spend mm -hmm. when they do and how this cohort of customers that we just acquired mm -hmm. is different than the one before or the one after basic blocking and tackling uh, mm -hmm. and, and and some of that will lead to the personalization but that's not necessarily why we're doing it we're doing it just to run our business more effectively um, which then leads to you know personalization. It leads to product development. It leads to collaborations mm -hmm. with other firms. But it all comes from the customer level data. Agree. So let's let's get our our fastball down and be able to locate our fastball before we start throwing the slurves and the sliders. So to that point, you mentioned cohorts. I actually. I'm going to have to, once again, it, it, I'm, I'm a student, I'm learning this is, you know, I would even look at like Shopify dashboards and see cohort analysis. And I would basically gloss over it. Okay, cohorts, what, what is that all about? And then I read this book. And next thing you know, my, I have a retail client that's, uh, you know, a, a multi-million dollar retail client, multiple locations, omni, omni channel. And I pulled out the cohort analysis after reading your book. And like, it just, because turns out customers change over time cohort analysis is important um for those of us who don't know what kind of insights do these c3 analysis and cohort analysis produce in the customer base audit process so let's back up a, a step and just make sure we're all clear on what we're talking about here you know there's yeah. a lot of people out there who use the word cohort and segment interchangeably uh, yeah. you know at, yeah. again at the, at the highest level it's a bunch of customers um, but they're actually very, very different from each other, and they're very complementary. So when we're talking about cohorts, we're talking about a group of customers who were acquired at the same time. They could be wildly different from each other. In other words, within a cohort of customers, within the customers that we acquired in Q1 2022, there will be segments. There will be differences. There will be some high, mediums, and lows. Mm -hmm. So let's be really clear on what we're talking about, because you are—you said it exactly right. I'm so glad you're honest about it. That, that sometimes people will gloss over. Sometimes people will say, you know, this, this doesn't really matter to me. Why are they just throwing all these words at me? It's really, really, really important. It's more important to be doing a cohort analysis than it is to be doing the segmentation analysis. But look at really? this group of customers that we acquired at a certain point in time. Understand what they're all about. Again, maybe use the segmentation to do some of that understanding. But then asking the question, how is this cohort different than the one that preceded it and different from the one before that? If we just mm -hmm. mush all of our customers together, even if we're kind of you know looking at the difference across them, it's really important to recognize that the newbies, the ones that we just acquired, are going to go through some big changes. You know, what, what, what happens is you acquire a bunch of customers, they kick the tires, they, they, they try you out, they buy you once or twice, and a lot of them leave. 
a lot of them mm-hmm. say, you know what, don't need this. This is no better than the other thing that I had. It's not as good as I thought. And that's okay. So you're going to see this, mm-hmm. this very, very uh, strong shakeout process with each group mm-hmm. of customers you acquire. You, you just have to know that most of those customers who made their first purchase with you, again, you know, uh, say today, um, won't still be buying from you or will be rarely buying from you a year from now. That's right. okay. It doesn't right. mean that you failed. It doesn't mean mm-hmm. that that uh, that you, you need to go back there and chase them down and say, please, please, please come back. I'll give you a big discount if you don't. Right. Um, uh, so, so understanding the, the laws of gravity, these laws of nature, is, is, is just, it's, it's so important. So when we're looking at the newbies, we know that's going to happen. When we're looking at the older cohorts, it, it already has happened. Yep. And so they are apples and oranges, these different cohorts. And so it's important to do the analysis at the cohort level so we avoid making mistakes or avoid mm-hmm. having fruit salad mm-hmm. by, by mushing together these different customer groups. And it turns out that not only do we see some really strong systematic patterns within a cohort, the shakeout, as I just described it, but we'll also see, generally see some strong patterns across cohorts. What happens yes. is the first cohorts we acquire are awesome. These are customers who love us, who have been lining up around the block waiting for our product. But the mm-hmm. next cohort, the next cohort, the next cohort, they tend to get a little bit worse. This is generally what happens. We start scraping the barrel. Uh, mm-hmm. And so it's important to understand these dynamics within and across cohorts. Shopify, you mentioned them. I have such respect for what they do. I have mm-hmm. such respect for a lot of the folks who sell through Shopify mm-hmm. because they are changing the rules. They are changing the mm-hmm. language. They are changing the metrics and practices of how mm-hmm. small businesses operate. And, and I think that, that again, these, these online sellers through Shopify are, are going to bring their practices with them mm-hmm. so that you know other small businesses that maybe aren't selling through Shopify will start to adopt those same practices as well including mm-hmm. cohort analysis. Right. Uh, and, and that's going to be just, just golden. It's, we're really going to get to the point where the big giant enterprises are going to be looking at the small, nimble ones to be uh, learning from them yeah. instead of yeah. the other way around. One follow-up on that, just to make sure I'm tracking, because I, I think this is extremely profound, because once again, a lot of us get trapped in um, just the monetary value or product stuff. Uh, recency, frequency, monetary value, there's a lot of time in there customer lifetime value time um i believe in the c3 analysis you talk about i believe it's you know it's the customer it's the time and then it's the product the time 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 um if we're trying to acquire high value customers retain them and develop them why is looking at time based analysis so important to being able to do those three things well so a couple of things number 1 I've, as i just referred to we do have these time dynamics within cohort. We do have these time mm-hmm. dynamics across cohorts. So, so time is, is just a critical dimension. Uh, we, we can't, it, it's great to take a snapshot. You know, in, in some sense, yeah. a lot of the analyses in the book, you, know, you, you just jump right to the cohorts. That's mm-hmm. what we call lens three. Right. But lenses one and two are just snapshots. Let's just take a picture of the right. customer base at, at, at a point in time or compare that picture across two points in time. So there's a, a lot of value just in the kind of, you know, non-time uh, aspect. Mm-hmm. So let's not yeah. ignore those. But, but but where the rubber meets the road um, is really understanding the dynamics over time. Uh, mm-hmm. and, and again, that d- doesn't come naturally to a lot of people. You, you yeah. kind of have to kind of force yourself to look at things that way. And so what I'm trying to do is, first of all, to, to make it a little bit easier to do by, by kind of laying out a roadmap, by basically uh, pointing out some of the, the, the big upside potential by doing it that way. Um, mm-hmm. uh, and to, to go one step further, instead of just looking at our customer base, you know, how they have evolved over time, to start saying, and what will they do next? And that's where the whole lifetime value thing comes in. We don't really talk about that in the book. The book is purely descriptive. The book is purely historical. But we hope that once people see these patterns, Mm time-based and otherwise, 
Mm -hmm. And it will beg the question, so what will they do next? And for how long? And how will mm -hmm. this cohort evolve compared to that cohort? Uh, and that kind of opens the door to lifetime value, which opens the door to customer-based corporate valuation. Right. Something I know you want to talk about. Um, right. So it's you know it's it's one step at a time. The the audit is just the, the right way to start mm -hmm. to, to start to organize this kind of thinking and the practices that come from it. And to the point, you know, as I was reading through the book, you're very slow and methodical and just talking about the, the analysis first. Here's how you do the different lenses. And then it's really at the very end of the book where we then we talk about getting actionable insights from that. I know that you've highlighted a little bit uh, already, hinted at a little bit, and it is in the book. But just for the listeners so they can understand the light at the end of the tunnel because ultimately you're going to do these different lenses to ultimately help guide your business on what it should do next – um, what are some of the, what is maybe one guiding principle um, when you're doing these uh, you know these lenses to then get those actionable insights? Well, and, and, for, and first, yeah, as a professor, I got to profess. So first, I'm going to take the the, the, the step back. Uh, you know, too often it is actions that drive analysis. Hey, we're about to launch this new product. Hey, we're about to go to a new geographic area. Hey, we're about to have a campaign, True. and that mm -hmm. determines what kinds of analyses we're going to do. I think that's a mistake. So one of the nice things about the audit is the, the regularity of it, the boringness, the routine mm -hmm. of it. I think it's so important to be doing the audit all the time, regardless of what actions you're taking. So let's okay. just run this audit. Again, it's, it's, it's like any kind of audit, like, a, like a, you know, a medical checkup or anything that you do on a routine basis. You're just, you're just doing it not because you're expecting anything interesting. In fact, like when it comes to medical appointments, boring is good. Yeah, yeah. So maybe the same thing with your customer base. So first thing is to kind of lead with the analysis and then see what kinds of actions arise from it as Smart. opposed to, you know, letting the actions drive the analysis. So, so here's, and there's just a ton of examples towards the end of the book. Big mm -hmm. shout out for our, our third co-author, Michael Ross. You know, he's mm -hmm. a practitioner. He himself has run a number of small businesses. Uh, and but he was he's just super smart and when had just did a lot of these analyses on his own and then it was sort of most a coincidental uh meeting and the cause us say you know what more companies should be doing this so here's a here's a really specific one when we want to look at uh, our, our product line don't just do so in terms of how many units of each product we sell because you know too often if we're having mm -hmm. if we're, we're having some you know e economic headwinds or we're ha we're doing battle with our distributors and we got to prune down the product line well which items are we going to get rid of well duh that's a stupid question we're going to get rid of the ones we sell the least of right that's often a big mistake what we want to do is to look at our products not on their own but through mm -hmm. the lens of the customers who buy them. Yep. And if we find out that certain products are disproportionately purchased by high value customers, mm -hmm. it might be the case that we don't sell a lot of units of those particular products. But if that's the gateway drug that helps us mm -hmm. acquire really valuable customers who are then going to buy a lot of other stuff from us, then those products got to be at the top of the list of the ones that we keep. Yep. So that's just an important, Important analysis again. We kind of almost bury it in the way back of the book when we talk about mm -hmm. bringing back the product dimension. But mm -hmm. but I want every company to look at its products yes. through the lens of the the value of the customers buy because the products that we sell the most of will generally be the ones that we're selling to a lot of those one and done customers. Yep. Like I said before. The, the, sometimes those weird niche products that are the ones that are that are really appealing to those high value customers, you would mm -hmm. not see that just from the the aggregate product information. But when mm -hmm. you go one level deeper with something like an audit, uh, once you see it, you can't unsee it. <laughs> right. It really will change the way you you go to market, the way you do R and D, the way yep. you promote your product. So I mean, that's just one mm -hmm. example. But, it, but I think it's, it's very typical of, of, of how you can be leveraging an audit just to operate more effectively. 
And it's once again, you're, you're, you're now using data and the data that's right under our nose is to capture the nuance that we're just glossing over or ignoring entirely because once again, none of these products are purchased in isolated vacuums. I even thought like, well, you could probably do the same exercise like if you had, uh, you know, a lot of different retail physical locations and one as an in isolation was not very profitable. Do we need to shut down the store? Well, if you found out that a lot of your highest value customers who then shop online because they first saw the store and then went into the store and made their first purchase, well, then that changes the math on how truly profitable or valuable that store is. And, you know, um, and Neil's book, he talks about, you know, CLV analysis can then lead you to figure out which acquisition channels were most influential when it comes to marketing campaigns to get in your highest value customers. Under the product lens, you're basically saying the same thing. It's just, okay, instead of acquisition channel, now we're talking about acquisition product. So now the math changes in, in context about how profitable a product line may be. So it's, it's absolutely brilliant. Let me ask you a follow-up on this for you know the people who are hopefully getting excited and wanting to do this uh, exercise within their own businesses is for quote unquote smaller businesses however extreme you want to go with that term is what do you think will be the most challenging task to to going through the analysis exercise of the the audit so it i, I hate these words it depends uh, if, if you're selling predominantly online if you're a shopify business Yep. It's easy. You have all of that data at your fingertips. You have it good. You actually have it better than a big company mm -hmm. does. It's just that mm -hmm. you haven't, uh, there's a good chance, haven't invested in kind of, you know, the, the data infrastructure, the CRM systems. You're just taking yep. the, the very basic reports that you're getting from Shopify or maybe some third-party vendors you're working with. Um, you, you need to invest in that stuff. Uh, mm -hmm. You, you, you got to realize that maybe not today. Today, it's just about pushing products out the door. I get that. But tomorrow, it's going to be about understanding the difference across the customers. So so it's, it's making sure that you have the right data infrastructure in play. Now, if you're not a Shopify business and you have people paying cash and it's much harder to tag right. and track them, um, that can be a big challenge. And mm -hmm. that's why you, you need to start thinking early on about setting up the loyalty program, the yep. mobile app, or some other mechanism where as people buy from you, even if they are paying cash, you want to get them to raise their hand and self-identify. Yep. Um, you want to make it worth their while to do so, whether it's discounts or whether it is value-added services that you can provide to them. Make yes. them want to know that, uh, hey, it's me making the purchase. You know, Please link it up with the other purchases I've made and then being very careful to use that data wisely without getting all creepy about it. Yeah. Um, yeah. So yeah it, it all starts with being able to collect and connect the, that data at a, at a granular customer level. Again, yes. getting far easier to do that all the time, but companies yes. tending not to prioritize that. And, and I'll just say to the audience on, on Pete's point is, um, even if you're, you know, a smaller business or you've got a lot of cash paying customers, if you go to launch something like a loyalty program where you can actually start to be able to track your relationship with your customers over time, you know, there's, there's ways that you can get better or worse adoption. But I tell you what, if you really make a genuine effort at it, your higher or highest value customers are likely to get on board with you trying to, you know, create some kind of general added value through a loyalty program. And then if you could start to capture at least that aspect of it, you're a long ways better um, with that kind of data measurement and, and, and transaction database, then you are without it. So, you know, uh, don't kill the, the good in pursuit of the perfect and, and, and get started. So I in love closing, that point. I, yeah, I love go that. Ahead. Uh, I just want to say real quick, you know, you've been doing a great job and I appreciate it. Kind of giving all the shout outs to book number three, but in book number one, customer centricity, there's a whole chapter in the back where we talk about CRM systems and their importance okay. and the kinds of things that a small business should be focusing on. I'm looking at Natasha, who's running a small hair salon, and basically asking the kinds of questions, what kind of data is like important versus just nice to know? And again, mm -hmm. what kinds of decisions are going to arise from that? So um, so I, I very much have small business in mind, even if most of the examples are you know, great big businesses. I think the lessons are very broadly applicable. Perfect. Um, now it's time for... Uh 
everybody to think about what do they do now. Now we've you've kind of you've shown them the path and you've put the challenge to them and you've made it easy for them to be able to uh, access this. You know, uh, customer base audit is available for sale across basically wherever you get books. And then Ditto, once you finish that with going into customer centricity, what actions do you hope? the customer base audit provokes in, in small and mid-sized businesses. So let's go right back to the subtitle, right? Because the audit is not an end unto itself. It is the first step on the journey to customer centricity. You know, I wrote all of these books as means for action. I just want to get people to wake up and say, whoa, wait a minute, it's different out there. And whoa, wait a minute, I can do this. Mm -hmm. uh, because a lot of these models that I've built have very strong implications about the actions to be taken, but a lot of them are kind of unconventional. And so people need, you know, they need their hand held a little bit. And that's yeah. where the startups come in. And again, I'm not here to try to push my own particular companies. You mentioned Zodiac, the one we sold to Nike, Theta, mm -hmm. the one that we're running now. Um, and there's lots of other companies out there that, that, are, that are doing this stuff very, very effectively. So again, not uh, toot my own horn here. In fact, I wish there were a zillion companies mm -hmm. that were helping companies leverage customer lifetime value and figure mm -hmm. out you know, what kind of message we should be sending to which kind of person. I want mm -hmm. that kind of, if you call it personalization, that kind mm -hmm. of customization. I really do want that to become more rule than exception. Yeah. even for small businesses. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think a lot of things that we do, and again, here I go again, um, you know, uh, shout out to book number two, uh, the Customer Centricity Playbook, implement a winning mm -hmm. strategy by focusing on customer lifetime value. There's lots of tactical trips, uh, uh, tips and tricks um, to be able to start leveraging this stuff. Uh, so lots of examples out there, uh, and I just want to see more companies using them, and I'm just delighted by what I've seen in the you know 10 years or so since I started writing these books and people like yourself who are out there helping to spread the gospel and mm -hmm. make some of these practices more regular. Uh, I know for my own benefit, it has been, it's it's opening up. I know that, you know, like you said, the, the boringness is the beauty of it. Um, I definitely am seeing the beauty and, and the, the boringness that is the customer base audit. So thank you, Pete, for spending time with us. Um, you definitely referenced the three books of which I've only read book one. So it sounds like I myself have some homework. Maybe we'll be able to get you back on some time to talk about the, the next steps. But uh, where can people uh, connect with you, follow you, be it your company or other uh, stuff you got out there? So uh, I'm easy to find. Google my name. That's and I'm happy to chat. I love uh, you know getting people to really understand and leverage this stuff. But Theta, uh, it, I, I want to recommend it again. I'm not here to sell anything, mm -hmm. but there's mm -hmm. for, for me, it's also a great platform to put a lot of these ideas and case studies out there. So yes. lots of good blog posts and uh, and and you know and, and and interviews and things like that. So if people go to ThetaCLV.com. Uh, mm -hmm. A lot of good insights, again, broadly applicable uh, and, and love to keep the conversation going. 100%. I will uh, reference uh, Theta CLV in the show notes. I will also reference the customer base audit released in 2022 by Peter Fader, Bruce Hardy, and Michael Ross. Great read. 100% recommend. Pete, thank you so much for your time and, and for sharing your insights with us. I really appreciate the, the chance to do so. I, I, I love your questions, your passion for it, uh, and, and the way that you are helping to shape a lot of best practices out there. I really appreciate it, Pete. Um, have a great finish of the year. Bye now.